Welcome to the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast powered by Hiscox. I'm your host, Sanjay Parekh. Throughout my career, I've had side hustles, some of which have turned into real businesses. But first and foremost, I'm a serial technology entrepreneur. In the creator space, we hear plenty of advice on how to hustle harder and why you can sleep when you're dead. On this show, we ask new questions in hopes of getting new answers. Questions like, how can small businesses work smarter? How do you achieve balance between work and family? How can we redefine success in our businesses so that we don't burn out after year three? Every week, I sit down with business founders at various stages of their side hustle to small business journey. These entrepreneurs are pushing the envelope while keeping their values. Keep listening for conversation, context, and camaraderie. Today, our guest, Rachel Allen, is joining us from Detroit, Michigan. She's a strategies and systems coach, and she wants to help you improve your business's operations. Rachel's company, Obsidia, helps Black-led and Black-serving organizations build sustainable systems and processes to ensure businesses are viewed through an equitable lens. Rachel is a HBS Young American Leader and recipient of a spot on Crane's 40 Under 40 list. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Sanjay. So um, there's a lot of fun stuff that we're going to talk about during this episode. But before we get into that, can you give us kind of a quick one or two minute background on you and how you got to where you are right now? Mm -hmm. So I will say I have been a reluctant entrepreneur. I told myself that I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. And yet here I am. I started my first business as a farmer's insurance agent, with an agency back about 20 years ago. So I started that when I was 21 years old. I have since worked in the nonprofit sector. I have been a chief operating officer by trade, um, but mostly I started a startup that helps small businesses learn how to manage their operations. And so now I exclusively work in the operations space. So I like to say that by day I'm a consultant and I actually perform this work for clients across the country. By night, I facilitate classes where I'm helping small businesses figure out how to apply some of the same strategies uh, into their businesses. And so again, as a serial entrepreneur, some people have hobbies. I have businesses uh, and I just love everything about what entrepreneurship does for folks, particularly how it changes economic trajectories for folks. Okay. I think you might be the first person that's been on the podcast that's called themselves a reluctant entrepreneur. Why, why were you a reluctant entrepreneur? Was there something that you saw that you were like, yeah, that's just not for me. And then you just got sucked in anyways. Oh, for sure. So I'm actually a second generation entrepreneur. My mother was an entrepreneur back in the early nineties when no one was really calling themselves an entrepreneur. She cashed out her 401k, started as a business, really doing like old school graphic design and what they call desktop publishing back in the nineties. She would help folks uh-huh. create business cards and flyers. And she had like this really cool office with the, a Xerox machine and a bunch of computers, which was really great. But I saw her really struggle. Like her passion was helping other black businesses also build operational capacity. And I, I associated some of the struggles that we have financially with entrepreneurship. And so I actually said out loud, I never want to be an entrepreneur. I said, I want a job that pays me every two weeks. And I wanted to live in the same house for the rest of my life. And I wanted to drive a Taurus. And so at that time, I I thought that was like the biggest dream I could have for myself. And I really thought I would be a teacher, not truly understanding that I have always had the spirit of a sage and an instructor. Uh, Even though my passion is business, I've been able to like translate that into a career. But for sure, I thought the path to entrepreneurship was too volatile and too risky. And I really wanted something that was safe. And boy, was I wrong about how, how that would work out for me. Yeah. And, and good that your dream changed because I don't think Ford even makes the Taurus anymore. Right. I like, I don't no. think it's a vehicle. <laughs> no, <they don't. laughs> so, uh, so my question was going to be like, well, did you have any entrepreneurs? Obviously you did in the family. Was there anybody else in the family that was an entrepreneur? No, not at all. In fact, there was a time when people thought my mom was crazy for leaving a good paying job and becoming an entrepreneur. And it's one of those things where back then there wasn't nearly as many resources or training programs. So in a lot of ways, I'd like to think that my mom was actually a visionary quite ahead of her time because now we live in a world and a society where there are business support organizations everywhere. 
particularly in the last few years, a lot of support for Black and brown owned businesses. That simply did not exist, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And so, yeah, my mom was the only entrepreneur in the family and, and certainly the only entrepreneur that I knew. Yeah, uh, I, I got the same thing when I quit my first job to start my first company as well. Like, why would you quit a good paying job? This doesn't make any sense. Just a couple of years out of college on top of that. So um, I, I can uh, understand that, uh, that experience uh, quite a bit. Um, for you though, was when you started your first company, was that your first entrepreneur, like doing the, the insurance thing? Was that your first entrepreneurial thing or had you done side hustles, uh, or, or things like that when you were younger, when you were a kid? Oh, for sure. So I was that person in high school that was braiding hair, cleaning houses, babysitting kids. And in college, I was writing people's papers. So not just like proofing them. I would be like, give me 150 bucks. I will write this for you. I was an English major in college. So I totally wrote a ton of graduate level um, thesis and reports. And so I was always doing things to kind of augment my income, not really realizing that that hustle mentality was something that would be a theme that I would carry into business. But for sure, starting the insurance business was the first time I had ever sold anything and had ever officially launched a business by myself. And I think the really great thing about that particular experience is by buying into a franchise, I was essentially buying a playbook that would become replicable. I didn't realize that at the time, but by learning mm. from a company like that, you actually are getting the exact framework that's going to be necessary for launching most kinds of businesses. Yeah. Sounds like you were a uh, chat GPT before chat GPT existed, helping uh, write uh, papers for people. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I got to tell you just last night, chat, G chat GPT saved my life. And so anytime that I think about <laughs> writing something, the first thought is, ah, chat GPT. I have the premium version and it just is so amazing. I got to tell you, if you are not using that for your business, you are missing out. Yeah. So um, when you started up this business that you're starting now, that, that you've got now, Obsidia, um, how did you start to, how did you come to the conclusion like, hey, I need to do this? Mm -hmm. And how did you get going? And how, how did you find your first client for it as well? Yeah. So I would say the, the consulting had always been a part of something that I would be doing organically. So friends, family, they knew they could call me. I would coach them through things. And I was doing that completely for free. Didn't even have the desire to figure out how to put a price tag on it. And so I had this idea once where my husband and I were actually starting a new business together. We were starting a photo booth company together. We took a small business class in the community. And that's when I realized that uh, there were so many programs that existed that taught people how to start businesses. There were no programs that taught people how to operate their businesses. And so that was one of my first aha moment of like, is there a way that I can coach and consult and help people learn about their business operations, specifically with an emphasis on systems, automation, and delegation strategies. And so that quickly turned into something I was doing on the side as just like nights and weekends. I would offer these boot camps. I ended up starting out charging $250 for the first boot camp, which was a six week program. I doubled it to 500, it sold out. I doubled the price again to $1,000 for that same boot camp. It sold out in 90 minutes. And that's when I really realized like I'm onto something. And so I really started thinking, okay, well, if I can educate these people, they're going through the classes and they're like, Rachel, this is great. I just need somebody to do it for me. That is when that next level of the business unlocked for me that, hey, what if I built a team of people who could actually do these things for companies? It took a bit of a, a pivot to realize that the small businesses were not our clients but foundations and large nonprofits, even high growth startups were our clients. And so our mm. first real client underneath this particular pivot um, was a youth development organization. And so we were able to say, all right, hey, I know the nonprofit space because my corporate experience helped me build that out there. They needed a fractional operations consultant, right? They weren't quite ready for a COO, but they absolutely needed somebody that they could leverage you know, their expertise from. And so uh, when that client became almost a nearly a six figure client and they actually agreed to pay me the price I was looking for, I even further knew this was the niche. And so since then, we've been able to really grow and scale, get even more specific in our niche. So now we offer program design where organizations come to us and we build entrepreneurial training programs for them. We white label some of our curriculum and content. We make it unique to the communities that they serve. 
And then we also do this fractional chief operating work where we become the COO for organizations across the country. And so I think for me, in just a really short amount of time, we were able to understand there's a need for this. My skill and my expertise, you know, really uniquely lends itself to that. And then adding that equity lens, I think, is really what helped make us super attractive to some of our clients. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So w- when you were starting all of this, um, and and I, you know, I, this is kind of a weird question now because you've been doing it for 20 years um, as a founder, um, but maybe it's still true. Is Was there anything that made you nervous about starting this business or gave, give you pause um, when doing this? Oh, for sure. You know, I've had the technical expertise for 20 years, but I think the the anxiety came from, will someone pay me this price to do this thing? And because this work has come so naturally to me, for years, it was hard to understand that I could make a living at something that came so easy to me, particularly because I thought the business that I would really choose would, would be harder. I think that's typically something I see with a lot of the founders that we work with, that we tend to take our gifts and talents for granted. So we don't quite realize that, you know, me being neurodivergent and, and my brain operating in a way where it's constantly looking for ways to be more efficient is actually a skill set that organizations would put value on and would pay for. And so I got to tell you, you know, starting out with that very first boot camp being $250 and shaking in my boots, thinking that someone would pay it. Uh, when I realized that my client was actually, again, a foundation or a large nonprofit, I actually exponentially increased my rate to where our clients pay nearly six figures for a one-year engagement with our team. And so yeah. you know, literally telling that story of saying this exact same strategy that I was using that originally was $250, you know, within four years is six figures was just a really clear way to me to say, finding the right client, finding the right way to solve their problems and making it lucrative enough for me to be able to build a team and design the kind of life I wanted to live. There was truly a niche for that. Right. So how did you, um, and and I feel like this was that nervousness a little bit. How did you come to that $250 price point uh, initially? Because obviously you, you vastly under, you know, valued that, right? Because you, you doubled and doubled again. Yeah. So how did you come to it originally? So I think my, the problem that I was, I thought that I was solving for people is would a group of entrepreneurs invest $250 to participate in a beta program that will help them learn how to build operational capacity? I got to say that up until that point, particularly in the Metro Detroit area, no one had actually presented curriculum and programming in that way. So there were lots of programs of like, hey, we're going to teach you about marketing and a little bit of financial and we're going to bring in these guest speakers and we're going to do this thing. What I was proposing is like, yo, I'm the facilitator and we're going to talk about operations. And so I think the, the nervousness around that was like, am I qualified enough to be the person who can do this? So the $250 price point was, I also wanted to make it affordable to the people who I wanted to participate. And so many of them were really struggling and weren't really generating revenue. And so for some of them, even the $250 investment was a stretch. And so what I think got tricky for me was when I would double the price just to kind of beat off some of the demand because so many people wanted to work with me, it started to feel incongruent with my desire to help more businesses. And that is actually what encouraged us to turn that part of the business into a nonprofit. And so now our programming is completely free to our entrepreneurs. We go after grants and philanthropic dollars to support our work. uh, And we're helping more entrepreneurs than we ever could have imagined. But there's still some skin in the game for them because they still have to invest in that six week time commitment. But our graduation rates are, you know, proving that people uh, associate value with it and want to be a part of what we're doing. Oh, that's so interesting. And and I love how you pivoted that into a nonprofit to to be able to really achieve your goal, which is reach and, and impact. That's great. Um, okay, so uh, r- running all of these companies is obviously going to create stress um, for you and, and kind of team and everything. How do you manage owning and running all of these things, a nonprofit, your for-profit, you like all of these things uh, with life and everything else that you need to get done and and take care of yourself. Yeah, I got to tell you, that is the million dollar problem that so many of our students, small (laughs) business owners and clients are trying to solve. So I really try to lead by example of being transparent about one, how difficult it is to be a CEO. 
there is a big difference between having a side hustle, running a side hustle alongside your corporate job, and then attempting to do this work full time as a career. And so a lot of the hustler mentality that I had that was really resourceful in getting me to this point no longer served me. So as a CEO, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And I I try to tell people that because if I'm not slightly discouraging them from getting into entrepreneurship, I haven't done my job because I think we do a great job of making entrepreneurship sound sexy and quitting your job as being really great. There's so many reasons why I try to discourage people from doing that path. But I also am transparent about the mental health challenges that the stress of being a CEO and an entrepreneur will create for you. And so I have to be just as unapologetic about carving out self-care time and rest uh, and sun and all of the things that I need to be a better human, because if I'm not getting those things, then I'm not actually serving my clients in the best way. I'm not serving my team in the best way. And I'm always on the brink of burnout. So I got to tell you that The job is not easy, but it's hard and it's hard for a reason. And I definitely like to share that because when other CEOs and entrepreneurs are saying this is really, really hard, it means they're probably doing it right, right? If it's so easy that you're like, oh, I'm not stressed about anything, you're probably not making CEO decisions because those CEO decisions are generally tied to other people's livelihood. It's tied to your own. It's tied to, you know, the sustainability. It's tied to finances, growth, expansion, And so, you know, I honestly will say entrepreneurship has been one, if not the most exhilarating thing I've ever been a part of, but it's also been just as equally challenging. Yeah. Uh, Before we started recording, you mentioned to me, you do this unique thing that helps you recharge. So tell us about what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So right now I am at an Airbnb that is in Detroit. And once a quarter, I call myself creating a blackout week. So At the top of the year, I looked at my calendar through the end of 2023, and I put a five-day stretch every quarter on my calendar where I would simply rest and recharge. And so this is important because that rest is different than a vacation. It's different than, you know, just kind of staying at home. So for this reason, I'm not at my actual house. I've gotten a change of scenery. I can walk to get coffee. I actually just met, you know, a friend for coffee, and I was able to walk to do that. But the blackout week is really important for me because what it helps me do is pause. I get to focus on things like more fun and spending time with friends and people who light me up, but I have to carve out space to mentally rest and recharge. My work can be really intense. I tend to work really long days. It's sometimes I even work seven days a week and I tell people no one cares that it's a Friday at five o'clock. No one cares that, you know, um, you've worked seven days. The work dictates the work. So because I have to be sometimes so aggressive in the way that I'm delivering value to my clients, I have to be equally aggressive in carving out time for me to pause and rest. And so being able to show my calendar link to someone and they can't book on that week, I don't, I'm not going to work around it. I'm not going to squeeze people in that week. They can wait. And then in that time, I get to really rest and recharge. So again, I've been having great lunch and dinner. I've been taking naps in the middle of the day. Again, having fun and just doing things because they're fun, not because they make money, but it's been really helpful for my mental health to have something to look forward to and to come back to the work just as energized and refreshed um, as when I left it. Yeah. So during this week, uh, is your spouse there with you as well or are you by yourself completely? I'm mostly by myself. So just last night, my husband and I went out for dinner and for drinks Uh, And then he left because I think he understands that as me being a textbook introvert, these are the kinds of things that I need to be able to have just for myself. And I don't really like having to share them, Uh, but I welcomed him into my bubble for just a little bit. And that was really nice. But most importantly, I do it by myself. And again, I think that's important because in my work, I am giving so much of myself, my time, my energy to my team, my clients, to new business and business development it is really nice to just binge watch Queen Charlotte. And I'm like, yo, people get to just like watch episodes of TV, like one episode (laughs) after the other, you can do that. And so I think, again, just having no place to be, not a lot on my calendar, but also the clarity to say, hey, I have some projects that I want to get across the finish line that I don't want to squeeze into just an hour or two to do, just feels really, really nice to be able to do. And so 
Uh, for 2024, I am going to move that up to every other month. And then I'd love to be able to carve out a time where at least once a month, uh, there is a week that is downtime for me. And so I got to work my way there because we're just at, we're so, business is going yeah. so well for us that that would be a little bit prohibitive. But I really want to work towards making sure that it becomes more of what my day and week looks like and less of something I have to kind of retreat to. Yeah. The, yeah. This binge watching thing that's the, all the rage is is kind of fascinating sometimes to do. And, I uh, hear. We I, definitely do I, it sometimes as well. <laughs> yeah. I typically don't have a lot of time for TV, so it's great just to enjoy a show. You know, that's that's really yeah. fun. What's since, since we're talking about TV shows, what's your um, kind of genre that you love a lot? Like, is there a specific type of show that you like? Oh, there is. Um, and it's, you know, it's true crime. So I got to tell you, I am probably one of the biggest true crime aficionados you've ever seen. Dateline has been my favorite show since I was about 12. And I love the problem solving. So you know that there's a murder. Somebody's guilty. By the end of the episode, they're going to be convicted. <laughs> And generally, you just don't know how you're going to get there. So I love a good like documentary style storytelling. But also, I, I'm always fascinated by the, the the criminal mind around how people think they can get away with these things, and they typically can't. So um, I got to tell you, my biggest next goal is to get to CrimeCon, because I think I will have found my people at the next one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the way you talk about uh, these true crime things is very much like an entrepreneurial mindset too, right? Like there's a problem, we've got to solve it. There's a solution. We just got to get there uh, to the answer. And also, I did not know there was a crime con, uh, oh, yeah. but uh, there you go. It's it's not surprising, but there you <laughs> have it. Is, it. is this just like true crime aficionados at crime con? Is that what that is? Absolutely. I mean, so it's like all of the different shows, all of the different networks, I mean, a lot of these these shows have cult-like followings. And so I think there are so many people, particularly who've gotten into like podcasts about it, which I really love as well. But I do think that there is yeah. this just really strong um, attraction to the storytelling, right? So Keith Morrison has got to be my favorite person of all of them. It's the, the voice, the tone, the way the stories are told, but also in a way that I think gives empathy to uh, victims on both sides of the crime. And I just think that the way that those yeah. stories are told with, with such care is just really important. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, let's get back to uh, business and entrepreneurship before we lose listeners thinking like, why am I listening to a true crime podcast all of a sudden? <laughs> um, let's think about, uh, talk about like the, the systems and technology and apps that you use. Um, what are some, you already mentioned chat GPT that mm -hmm. you absolutely love it. Um, what are some others that you use and have implemented that you would absolutely recommend to others who are running their own business? For sure. So we actually teach a course in operations school where we learn all about systems. And I like to say that there are different systems that you need to run different parts of your business. So as an example, a very, very important tool to use is some type of customer relationship manager or a CRM. That's going to help you track things like the conversations that you're having with people. Um, it might keep track of you know, all of your projects in one place. And so for that, I like to say that you need a system to manage your projects. So we use apps like Monday.com to help us really keep track of all of the nuanced things that go into managing those projects. I love a system like QuickBooks and Bill.com to manage our invoicing, our accounts payable, our accounts receivable. Uh, I even use Calendly. It's something I do use every single day. And I play this game where if I'm working with someone, uh, I typically share my Calendly link first and now you got to work around my schedule. And so I, I love that I'm always looking for apps and technology to solve the problems that I face. But I also try to really encourage folks that there is an app to solve every problem that you have in your business. We tend to default to a place of doing uh, something that's more manual or adding people to solve a problem. I typically look through the world through a lens of what technology already exists so that I can solve my problem quicker and more efficiently and spend less time thinking about these kinds of things. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, okay, so thinking now, um, you've been an entrepreneur for quite some time. If you could go back in time and do something differently, what would that be and why? Oh, wow. If I could go back in time and do something differently, 
I would have taken a bet on myself and stepped out into full-time consultancy sooner. I think I thought that I needed more degrees or more corporate experience, but my intuition has always been one of my best tools in leadership. And I've always had the same passion for supporting entrepreneurs and organizations today that I did 20 years ago. I think that particularly for women of color and for Black women in particular, imposter syndrome is real. And so when we look at, can I have a six or a seven figure business? We think I have to have all of these other credentials and letters behind our name and all of these other things. And I got to tell you, I was one of those people. I am super accomplished as it relates to awards and accolades and all of those things. So to a certain degree, I needed that to continue to build credibility for the work that I do. But knowing what I know now, I would have taken a bet on myself sooner And the same way that I had to get to the end of my corporate career to cash out my savings, quit a corporate job and do this big, scary thing, I would have done it sooner. I would have done it less afraid with less money, less responsibilities, and I just would have simply done it sooner. And so I think that when I meet people who are in that place that I was where the job is burning them out, you know, not living up to your fullest potential is burning you out. Those are signs that it's time to just take that leap. But most importantly, when you're betting on yourself, you can't lose. So knowing that today, I would have just taken the leap sooner. Yeah, that that is great advice. And I think we see this all the time, right? It is a scary thing, but I think you got to think about what's the downside, right? Like you can always go and get a job again, right? Like it, it's, it's not like it's a one-way street that once you quit your job and become an entrepreneur, you can never go back. Right. Somebody will take you back. You just got to find the right place uh, if things don't work out and then, you know, give it another try maybe later yeah, on down the road. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been working with um, companies and helping with their uh, ops and things like that um, for quite some time. Uh, what's like one of the biggest mistakes that companies make uh, in kind of dealing with their operations? Ooh, I would say they wait too long to get the right systems and technology. And so typically when people are calling us, they are at a critical point in their operation where they're being forced to integrate systems and technology. Some really Uh, recent examples are, you know, a client is getting a new contract and they have to double their size, the size of their operation, or they have to hire new staff. And these things typically have to happen quickly. And because most of our businesses that we work with are, they're still considered small businesses, right? They've got 49 employees or less, but they're still big businesses. Change has to happen much faster in small businesses than it does in a corporate bureaucratic organization. And so they recognize that they need systems and automation and integrations, and they need to come to the 21st century, but they've usually waited too long. And so now they're losing business to their competition. You know, they're, they're um, not as competitive with their staff and folks that they're looking to hire. And so I think that when businesses are, are generating revenue and they're making money, they tend to not want to break what isn't broken. So they stick to those outdated policies, procedures, and, and, and the way of doing business because that feels safer and more comfortable. But I mm. definitely encourage folks to start with systems in a way that says when you have one or two clients, you should still be using Calendly to schedule them and, you know, all of these other tools to manage them. So, I, you know, treating those two clients as if they're your biggest two clients, because eventually the same level of energy or the same infrastructure that you're going to need for two, you're going to need for 20. And so I would say folks just need to start sooner with systems. Oh, that is great advice. Um, okay. Uh, last question for you. Uh, if you were talking to somebody who's thinking about taking that leap and turning their side hustle, starting a side hustle or turning their side hustle into a full-time business, what advice would you give them? Mm-hmm. So that's, that feels multi-pronged, Sanjay. I would start with that side hustle that you're doing. I would encourage it to be something that's tied to a passion that you organically have. People typically want to start side hustles because they make money. And I got to tell you, that is the, the most ridiculous advice you, you will do. I want you to pick that thing that you think you can't get paid to do because it's come so natural to you, right? Yeah. You, you take it for granted. It's something that you can do in your sleep. It's almost effortless. Those are the kind of businesses that you should use as your side hustle because the more you love it and the more natural energy you have towards a thing, 
the more handsomely you're going to get rewarded with money because that's just an energetic exchange. So I encourage people to tie their side hustle to something that they love and that they love naturally. Set the money aside. The second piece is once that side hustle is starting to compete for space in your real life, that's when you start to think about it as a business. So as an example, if you are making so much revenue in your side hustle that it's starting to conflict with your day job, that's a sign that it might be time to grow. If it's consuming so much of your energy and you love it so much that all you can think about is doing that thing, that's probably a sign. And so I would also say if you found that thing, give yourself an incremental pathway of sustainability. You don't have to quit your job to see if your business is going to work. But you might have to say to yourself, maybe I can't do all of these other things. Um, I have to be a bit more selfish with my intention as I figure this out. And so I encourage people to take that path, right, which is start the thing that you love, find a way to make money doing what you love to do. You hear people say that it's so cliche, but it's just really true. And the money will come. You know, I, I had no idea that doing the kind of work that I love so much would turn out to be such an amazing group of businesses to have. And it's given me a really rewarding life because I tend to focus on the passion that I have for the work and less on the money. Yeah, that is great, great advice. Um, Rachel, this has been awesome. Where can our listeners find and connect with you online? They can reach me at rachelallen.com and that's R-A-C-H-E-A-L allen.com. Uh, and I would say I'm on LinkedIn, a little bit on Instagram and Facebook, but mostly through our website. If you'd love to learn about the work that we do, you can check out my personal brand there. It takes you to all of my different places on the universe. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast, powered by Hiscox. To learn more about how Hiscox can help protect your small business through intelligent insurance solutions, visit hiscox.com. That's H-I-S-C-O-X dot com. And if you have a story you want to hear on this podcast, please visit hiscox.com slash share your story. I'm your host, Sanjay Park. You can find me on Twitter at, at Sanjay, that's S-A-N-J-A-Y, or on my website at sanjayparek.com.